Hey, fanboy nation. This is your pal Daffy Duck, and you're watching. You're watching. We're watching. You're watching. Fanboy. 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 A fanboy, etc. Fanboy nation. Dot. I assume. Dot. Um. <laughs>this afternoon i'm speaking with tom hurd who is the filmmaker and star behind the movie getting it available now on vod and dvd tom how are you today i'm doing great how about yourself no complaints man no complaints you know just uh hanging in there and doing yeah. my own thing cool nice to see you uh face to face finally right you know except i yes. need to shave i know yeah Oh man! So tell me about getting it. You know, this is an indie indie film out of Texas. It's got a bit of a Western feel to it, blended in with the LGBTQ plus, uh, you know, background. Right, right, yeah, um, yeah. It does have a Texas feel because I, uh, that was intentional. I wanted to showcase Austin a little bit and the, uh, the incredible Texas Hill Country. So we have some great scenes out there, uh, a little rustic, and uh, got some. Great shots of some Texas streams, and uh, yeah, uh, I wanted to um, really, you know, show show life as it is here in Austin, uh, um, so the world could you know, see uh, what's going on here and uh, and how beautiful it is. Uh, we had done a pre-interview a couple of days ago just to catch up and get some ideas on what's going on, but really take us through getting it and getting it made because. You know, you had some struggles as an actor out here in California and then in other parts of the country in getting roles and trying to make things happen. You know, empty promises that have come about. And it seems that other parts of the country are more willing to get things done in a more timely fashion. There's definitely an independent spirit, you know, in various uh, pockets of the country. You know, it's going on in the South a lot. Uh, Shreveport was kicking kicking it for uh, several years there, and there's a lot going on in New Mexico as well. Atlanta now is pretty much Hollywood East. Um, they have the biggest studio in the country, and uh, they're doing great. Um, I am. Um, I did. I have been kicking around for a while. I I did. Some good stuff in LA when I was out there too. I got cast in a, in a film called True Rights and had a great time doing that. Um, that film had a difficult time finding distribution, but um, it was a, a terrific film. And but uh, yeah, it's um, uh, you know it is a tough business, you know. And until you get that big break, you know, it can it can it can wear you down and it can be very frustrating. Um, I had just gotten cast uh, in an episode of uh, Friday Night Lights playing a doctor and that was very exciting and I was trying to keep the ball rolling with that. I very soon after that got cast um, in another show called The Lion Game, playing another doctor. And so like my agent calls me on a Tuesday and says, hey, you got the part. And uh, then I was like, great. And on Wednesday she calls me back and without ever having seen anyone again or anything, she goes, oh, they, uh, they went with your, the director's second choice. And I was like, oh, what? Um, that's, uh, that's that's pretty rough, you know. Um, I don't know, you know, what their thinking was. Maybe because I just played a doctor, and they didn't think I should play another doctor. Because Friday Night Lights is pretty well known, and maybe they figured the audience had seen me in that. So um, I that at that moment, it was really it all came crashing down on me when I thought I really got to try and do something for myself, you know, and and be more proactive. And I'd heard that for a long time. A lot of friends, a lot of actor friends saying, you know, you have to start writing. And I'd never written anything, really. Um, I dabbled with some poetry and things like that, but um, never any, no major project. And um, I thought, you know, I, I, I've got to see if I can do it. And uh, I, I sat down to, to write my dream role, or a role that I really wanted to play, because uh, I wasn't seeing anything out there like that. And, um, and, Happily, in the process, I found that I not only enjoyed writing a role that I wanted to play, but writing roles for other actors, um, and and with particular actors in mind, and uh, and it's really fun. And and um, and I, you know, being an actor, I know what actors want to play, what they like to play, what they find interesting and challenging and rewarding. So I I either I either you know am good at it or I just got lucky uh, and wrote uh, a lot of good roles for other actors that they were very happy and very excited to play. Um, 
with the story itself in, in getting it, we had mentioned, and I, and I told you, you know, I, I cover a gambit of films from the LGBTQ plus, uh, and I'm getting tongue tied, LGBTQ plus. Uh, it's a lot of letters. It is. You know, you guys have <laughs> vowels now, man. Make it, you know, make an acronym <laughs> so you can actually pronounce something instead of just reading off. Right, right, right. Uh, all the way to faith-based films. And what I've noticed, the similarities between the two, which people are going to sit there and go, really, RC, the similarities, um, is that each one has their own tropes that they follow, whether with the faith-based films, there has to be this, you know, this fallen moment, this struggle moment, this biblical passage and talking to a, a minister moment, and this leading to the redemption of the character versus the LGBTQ plus films where we need you know, a person that's a lesbian. We need a gay guy. We need a trans person. Right. You know, we, like it, it turns into a checklist of things that need to be touched on, whether for inclusion or for the storytelling that kind of take people out of the story itself. And in this one, mm -hmm. what you do with getting it is you just tell a story. And if anyone happens to be anything else, they're just there. It didn't have that Harley Quinn size mallet from from batman you know the giant mallet that she uses in the cartoons and the comics to bash you right. over the head and saying here's our point and we've made our point so i commend you on that oh thank you very much i think i got lucky again because uh as a first time screenwriter i'm really not aware of all these these uh prerequisites that uh people often have uh for screenplays and you got to have this at this point and this at that point i knew a little bit i have some friends that are screenwriters and they kind of gave me some guidelines but for the most part, it's not like something that I had drummed into me. You got to have this person and that person and at that place, this needs to happen, whatever. Uh, I, just, I just wrote the story that I wanted to see. I wrote the movie I wanted to see and, and it just came out that way. And, and I think I, I got lucky, you know, um, and I'm gonna, uh, in the new film I'm writing, I'm gonna be doing it the same way. Just, just write a story and not worry about you know, if we have specific types and, and, uh, and the things have to, have to occur. And they really don't have to occur at like the 10 minute mark or the halfway mark or whatever, but uh, you know, it's a good guideline, but um, it, the more important thing is to tell a story that's interesting and that will hold people's attention that they care about. And with that, you know, uh, independent film in the 90s allowed us to do that. And again, 25 plus years later, uh, we're, we're seeing that coming back where, where it's the rise of the indies yet again. We saw it in the 70s. We saw it, well, technically we saw it in the 30s and then eventually in the 70s and then so on and so forth into the 90s and now back again. Um, in independent filmmaking, you're allowed to tell a story without hitting those markers and without having people breathe down your neck. How much more right. freeing has it been being your own studio versus working in the studio system? Uh, it's, it's, it's really fulfilling. It's really, uh, exciting, uh, to be able to, to, you know, call the shots. You're only calling your own shots, but it's great to not have, you know, have to worry about someone else's opinion, um, telling you how it should be and what they think it should be. Um, it's great. Uh, it's very freeing and, and, um, you can just, to be able to write whatever you want to write in the way you want to write it, uh, that's, it's a gift, you know, uh, to, to be able to, you know, have that opportunity. And uh, I, I'm hoping that when I, uh, you know, get this new one started, which I'm about to start writing, that uh, I'll, I'll feel the same way about it. Um, uh, I'm really not going to worry about, um, like you mentioned, you know, hitting those marks. I, I'm just going to tell a story uh, the way I want to, tell it and the way I'd like to see it. Um, and uh, hopefully I'll um, be able to uh, do, do the same thing again like I did with getting it. Right. Uh, take me through the story of getting it itself because, you know, one of the characters is a struggling poet and you mentioned that, that you've only dabbled in poetry prior to taking on, you know, a screenplay itself. And the relationship between your character of Jamie and then, uh, Donata De Luca's character of Ben and how it evolves because it almost comes across like for those that are just going to read the description at first is like you're trying to win a bet with your friends of you know see I'm not selfish I can dedicate myself to a person and then really end up right. dedicating yourself to that person 
Right. Yeah, and there are a lot of movies, you know, where, and like in, especially in romantic comedies, when there is a bet, you know, and uh, it's kind of when and the whole thing of boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl, it's always the boy loses the girl when she finds out that his friends put him up to a bet or something like that. Um, this really wasn't like, um, uh, uh, it wasn't a bet per se. Uh, my best friend is very frustrated with me. She's angry that I've become very selfish since I got dumped. Um, by my partner, like a, a year before the story begins, and I've be, and I've always been a pretty selfish person. In fact, that's why my partner says that he dumped me was because of, of my my selfishness. Um, and it seems that since that takes place, um, my character Jamie, his anger uh, makes him you know go inward even more and and you know uh, shut out the world and put himself first. And my best friend, who has loved me for years, um, has finally had it you know and she says you know this is why he dumped you um this is why your life sucks and and it's like a hand in the face to to jamie he's like what are you even talking about he hasn't even he has no perspective on himself and so um he meets his neighbor who is a poet and um and, and ben the poet is going through this horrible um uh, grieving period he's lost his mother uh also about a year before the story begins and he blames himself, and his brother also blames him, and and there really was no blame. Uh, he's just uh, he loved her unconditionally and and devotedly, and um, uh, it's just the way things played out that he has blamed himself. And so he lives with his brother and his sister-in-law Alicia. And um, uh, when the two of them meet, when Jamie and Ben meet, uh, they have this exchange, and Ben has shut off the world as well, um, but he. He sees something in Jamie. Um, he, uh, Jamie is this former cabaret singer, and, and he gets humiliated in a public performance, and he swears he swears off public uh, singing. So all, all he does is sing in his own apartment. But he's usually singing these kind of cheesy, up-tempo Broadway show tunes, and um, and uh, Ben through the wall can hear this, and he doesn't have much of an opinion, a high opinion of Jamie. Basically, he thinks he's, you know, he's singing these frothy, you know light light songs and things you know what's up with this guy and so when they meet and and then can see for himself that uh jamie is more than that um he becomes a little a little um in, intrigued and uh when alicia gets wind of this she cares so much about uh about ben and she wants him to come out of this depression uh she asked jamie my character if he might spend some time with ben and Jamie's go-to response is always, ah, you know, something, ah, I wish I could, you know, but things are crazy right now and I just can't. And then he has a moment and he remembers uh, not only um, does his best friend, you know, uh, Elaine call him on his selfishness, but he actually confronts his ex after she's told him that that was why he uh, dumped him. And he confirmed it. And he's like, damn it, you know, I... I don't think this is true and, and I, I don't believe it, but I'm gonna prove them wrong. I'm going to I'm gonna go out of my way and help somebody. But it's not to help the guy, it's just to prove his friends wrong. He's still doing he's doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. Um and so uh when he 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 then does an about phase of one eighty and says to Alicia, Yeah, all right, I'll spend some time. And so they do. They start hanging out a little bit and they go on this road trip and um Ben is very excited. Ben Ben has decided that he is uh, he is interested in Jamie, and he thinks this is uh, you know a, the beginnings of a romantic getaway or something like that, and and um, kind of makes his intentions known to Jamie. Jamie rebuffs him immediately, um, but because uh, he kind of just thinks Ben is you know this this kind of morose little little guy who um, doesn't really have a whole lot of personality because he hasn't seen it yet. And then little by little during this trip, um, some fun things happen and, and Ben has come out of his shell and has, you know, he keeps prodding uh, Jamie, and keeps goading him, you know, to, to be more fun and to enjoy life a little bit more, which Jamie begins to do and he begins to fall for, for Ben. Um, and he, he, begin, he falls hard. Um, and then uh, they start to see each other. But the second that, Jamie is presented with another opportunity to really go on on a limb and, and help Ben. He doesn't do it. 
and uh, because he wasn't doing this, he wasn't helping Ben for the right reasons in the first place. He just happened to fall for him while he was doing it, but he really hadn't changed. Um, didn't even read Ben's poetry. You know, he was just like, he, he dismissed it as, you know, just some kid, you know, just dabbling. And um, so uh, when he, when Ben asked him to do this thing for him and Jamie declines like multiple times, um, Ben says, all right, you know, and Ben had been warned by, um, by people, uh, other people about Jamie and, and he didn't believe it at first, but now he sees, you know, oh, you know, I guess what I was told is true and I better take care of myself or this guy is going to, you know, just. Well, let me know. stop you right there so we don't go too yeah. far into every story. Oh, okay, sorry. Film. Okay. No, because we want people to see it, but I mean, it's, it's an intriguing story and, you know, there are okay. people like me that, uh, that like spoilers to know what's going on and the other people that don't want to know past the uh, first 15 minutes. So, gotcha, absolutely. You know, we'll, we'll keep it at that. that. That's enough to entice people into the story. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about this. We discussed this a bit in the pre-interview, um, mm -hmm. but I want to expand on it. You know, we, we talked a little bit about the political climate, not politics itself, but personal responsibility. And the country is very much more purple than it is red or blue and the way people have been portrayed. And Texas is considered a red state and people think that, you know, uh, have this weird fantasy in the way Texas has been portrayed of people running around shooting off guns and like, you know, it's 1865 and there's still cowboys everywhere, uh, even right. though there is a bit of that cowboy spirit still around. Um, and you tell this very, quote, blue story as in blue state, not as in blue as in foul language, uh, in a red state. Um, the reception to that being in a more conservative state with a more liberal story, which is really what society as a whole is versus what's being portrayed from various media sources. How important was that to the character of Jamie and Ben's relationship and the film getting it itself? Well, um, uh, Texas is definitely a red state, although they say it's purpleizing, that it's uh, headed towards being purple. Um, but uh, I actually live in one of the only blue counties uh, and blue cities. Uh, well, the cities are all pretty, pretty blue. It's the, it's the rural and the regional parts of Texas, which is huge and thousands of, of cities, you know, that are very conservative and definitely in that red sea. Um, but Austin and uh, the county I live in, Travis County is very blue. And um, plus I'm working in an industry that is very blue. Uh, and uh, so I never, uh, run into any kind of resistance or any negativity at all. In fact, it's been the opposite. Um, uh, people, when they hear the story, they they uh, they think it's intriguing as well. And uh, they, if the bottom line is, it's just the story. You know, um, uh, they just want a good story. That's what people want. And um, so it's been actually, you know, it never even uh, was a concern. You know, uh, because. I do feel pretty insulated uh, here in Austin and, uh, and working in this industry where there are so many you know, open-minded people and, and uh, so many you know, members of the LGBTQ community. Um, so it never really was a concern or um, anything I needed to, uh, to account for. Um, it, was, uh, it was just, you know, my experience in Austin uh, uh, as well has, has never been anything but um, positive. Um, growing up here uh, in Texas. Well, I'll say after I grew up, you know, when you're a kid uh, growing up, you know, it's, um, you've got a big secret, you know, and it's not until you're a little bit older that you can start sharing it. So um, I've never had anything, um, I've never had any kind of, um, you know, naysayers or anybody saying, you know, you really shouldn't tell a story like this or something like that. It's It's been quite the opposite. And that's, you know, that, that's just really terrific. And I think you find that anywhere, you know, in, in any state, um, really. Uh, I, I just think people, you know, their politics, you know, if they're, even if they're conservative, even, even oftentimes when they're, when they're um, uh, evangelical or Christian, um, they, they might, they have these concepts and conservative concepts and, and beliefs, but when they meet people and individuals, um, people are, so, so often they're just, you know, they're kind, you know, and, and they're caring and, and they, and most people, most people like other people, you know, and um, so they, 
once they get to know somebody and, and meet somebody and get to know them, um, if they're from a different walk of life or something, they, they generally are, in my experience, they're just very um, open and accepting of people when it's an individual situation. You know, when you look at broad, you know, uh, platforms and, and politics and stuff like that, they say, well, I'm definitely, I believe in this, this, and this. Um, but uh, when, you, when, when you humanize it and it comes down to an individual uh, level, um, people, you know, people are much more open and open-hearted and, um, and open-minded. And you know, do you see that going the other way? Because you see, you know, you mentioned Christians and evangelicals and the evangelical movement is quite large in Texas. Uh, but from the, uh, from the other side of the community, the LGBTQ plus community, when they encounter somebody like here in Southern California, it tends to be judgmental, you people, you people, you people. And then on the inverse, you people, you people, you people. Yet you mentioned it on the individual level. Um, how do we break that stereotype between the two communities then? Of, you know, it's you, you, you versus, you know, with the perception that we've had or a couple of encounters that we had. In you know, and then flip it the other the other way, and how the other side does it to each other. I, I missed you just a little bit. I didn't quite quite get it. Sorry. Like, say, you know, I I grew. I'm originally from San Francisco. All right. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, I'm also a Christian myself. Uh, but I've heard from the the other side. Oh, you Christians are this 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 and this. And right. I'm not an evangelical Christian. You know, I'm I'm Greek Orthodox. And I was like, well, I don't know what you're talking about because that's not us. And then right. you know, I've also heard religious people go, go to people in your community and go, well, you guys are this, this, and this. And like, well, that's not us. That's, you know, the, the party, you know, the party club scene. That's not everybody. Right. So how right. do you break the stereotype mold and just find some more middle ground between the two? Because like I said with the film, although this, you know, it's a very, you know, blue state story in a red state, even though Austin's more blue state, it still has right. to have that middle ground of Texas being a central part of it, especially when you show the Texas scenery. Right, right. Yeah, um, I think, I think um, in this specific situation between, like, say, the LGBTQ community and, and uh, evangelical Christians and, or, uh, or just Christians in general, I think it's very, it, it's very uh, similar to Democrats and Republicans. You know, it's, it's each side vilifying the other. Um, uh, falling back into easy, the easy trap of just, you know, of not seeing people as individuals and, and um, thinking, oh, if you, if you're like, if you're that, then that means you meet, you believe that. And just, uh, just last night, um, I was talking with a friend of mine um, and she is, uh, they are um, uh, fiscally uh, very conservative and believe in, um, less government and, and are and therefore pretty much identify more as Republicans. Um, and, um, uh, but socially she's, she's all blue. Um, and see, people aren't all one thing, you know, they're multidimensional. And so, so each person in each group, no matter what the group is, is their own person. And, and that's what people have to keep remembering. Democrats have to remember about, about Republicans and vice versa. Any group, you know, Hispanics or, 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 or African-American, uh, any group needs to, you know, any person in any of those groups when thinking about another group needs to remember um, that they're all individuals in that group and nobody's exactly the same. And, and I think one of the ways to, to, to get to that place where people start thinking more like that is through film, you know, and people telling stories, you know, and showing people um, like my character is gay, but, but, uh, he, that's not the story at all. It's not about being gay. It's about a, a guy who has, um, withdrawn from the world and is being very selfish and putting himself first. And that can be anybody, you know, in any group of any persuasion of any race. And so it's, it's, we've got to just remember that we're individuals, you know, and yeah, we might be a member of a certain group or polit political persuasion. But, but we're individuals first, and we're people first, we're human beings first, and we're multifaceted. And, uh, and there, there are good people and bad people in each and every group. And uh, that's, just, that's just that we're all, but there's one race, in my opinion, you know, the human race, that's it. And, um, and that's what people, I feel, should 
try to to remember and keep in mind when thinking about any other group or person in another group. And if you don't like something, you don't have to do it. It's just that simple. Say again? I said, and if there's something you don't like, you don't have to partake in it. And it's just that simple. You don't have to remember exactly. anybody else's. Exactly. Yeah. Live and let live. And I'm, and I'm happy we touched upon this because, you know, there's so many different walks of life and the movie itself is so multi-layered that we want to talk about those different layers in how, in, in how storytelling develops and without finger pointing. And I'm glad that, you know, we're discussing a middle ground because I think we really need that right now in society. And I think that's what's mm -hmm. been missing in film and in, you know, the Hollywood scene itself, because some people try to go so far one direction to prove just how much they're in line with a specific ideology that they almost lose their own humanity in adhering to an ideology, whether it's left or right. Right, exactly, yeah. Um, and, and one of the things about the film that I wanted to do was, was to just, there's no politics in the movie, you know, it's not about, it's not about uh, people's perception about any, any, any position or any group or anything. It's just uh, uh, Jamie and Ben's uh, uh, sexuality is just a happenstance. It's just, you know, it's just part of who they are. This is a story about two men and, um, and that's, just these, these two human beings, you know, just happen to be this and that, they, uh, you know, whatever race they belong to, whatever um, part of the country they live in, uh, and whatever, you know, political persuasion, whatever, you know, that's, that's all, that's all, you know, uh, it's not part of the story, you know, it's just about two guys, you know, and, and their struggle to, to deal with, with what they're going through personally, you know, and it just has nothing to do. I, 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 this is one of the main things when I sat down to write the movie, you know, there are a lot of great LGBTQ films about coming out and what their uh, family thinks of them, what society thinks of them, even in the workplace, or whatever. And those are important. And I think they've, they've been both entertaining in some cases and educational. I wanted my movie to be different. I, uh, there, not that mine's the only movie like this, but I just wanted my movie to be, it wasn't about the coming out process, anybody discovering who they are. You know, these are two, two men who know who they are. And it's about other parts of being human, you know, just the personal parts and, and the difficulties of two people um, forging a relationship and maintaining a relationship um, and the difficulties and challenges involved in something like that. And for a first time filmmaker, which it was hard to believe that it, this is your, your first screenplay that you wrote, um, it's very human and it's very real. It's not, you know, you seeking the perfect words. And in this moment, I have to have this character say this, and I'm going to say that and make sure it's like this perfect thing. It's very human and very realistic and very in the moment. I think that's what I appreciate the most about the situation is that, again, it's not the paint by numbers thing that we've talked about in the past. It's just is, and that's the significance of the story itself. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm really glad that uh, that you you felt that way about it. That means a lot to me. I, I really appreciate it, and uh, that's that's everything. You know that uh, that that only spurs me on to uh, to try to do the same thing in, in the next in the next script. Well, I can't wait to see when that's finally done and and uh, in production. Me too. Maybe, you know, maybe it'll be safe enough to do a set visit, and I'll fly out to Texas and see it. Oh, that'd be awesome! I would love it. I think it'd be a good time, man. You know, I haven't been to Austin. I've been to San Antonio. I've been to Houston. I still got to check out uh, Austin and Dallas. You definitely do. Yeah. Um, Austin and Dallas, uh, and San Antonio, uh, all three are, are really, really uh, terrific places uh, to, to be, to, to experience uh, so many amazing uh, historical um, uh, places uh, and the, the, the geography of Central Texas, Austin, San Antonio, going out into the, uh, the Highland Lake chain, uh, there's just nothing like it. It's, it's remarkable and there's a lot to see and a lot to do. I just got to avoid Houston during monsoon season. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Houston, I used to call Houston um, the LA of Texas only without hills and it was totally flat. Um, and I was kind of selling it short because uh, Houston, Houston, um, See, most of Texas feels very new. Uh, you know, I've lived in New York, and I've, even L.A. Uh, feels older than Texas, you know, and, you know, the missionaries were out there, you know, hundreds of years before um, uh, you know, anyone really uh, started settling, you know, Texas. And, um, 
Uh, Austin feels very new and San Antonio even to a certain degree. But Houston has this older feel. Um, it was a big city uh, decades before Austin was. Um, and so it's got its own thing, you know, uh, you know, cracked streets, you know, and, and the towering, towering trees, you know, in these, in these uh, old residential neighborhoods. It's, uh, it's beautiful in Houston. Uh, and it's just, um, you know, a lot of people that have never been to Texas don't realize how green it is. And Houston is a forest. Um, just a trillion pine trees, you know, and um, it, it's a lot. It's a lot to see. It's um, it's a great thing to see. All right, Tom. Before I before I let you go, because uh, we're going to be talking again about the next movie anyway, and we're going to be talking throughout the year, no matter what, because we become fast friends o- over your projects and just you being great. Right, thanks. Thing. Absolutely, man. Um, you know, we have the chance of ordering the movie and getting the DVD or watching it on VOD. Uh, two things. What's something that you left on the cutting room floor to use the old terminology since we're shooting everything digital now uh, that you wish would have ended up in the final cut but didn't fit the narrative that's going to be a great DVD bonus? And then why should we take the time this holiday season? Because even though it's not a holiday movie, in California right. we're on lockdown. I don't know if they locked you guys down in Austin yet to sit down and watch getting it. Well, uh, well, I'll start with the last question first. Um, uh, if, if what interests a person is um, seeing all the challenges and, and um, um, workings of a, uh, an, an, an interpersonal relationship, two people coming together and, and how, how exciting and wonderful that is, but also the... Um, the complexities of, of maintaining it and and um, um, and, and staying together. Uh, if 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 you enjoy a love story, if um, if you <laughs> even though it's a, a modern take on it, twist on it, uh, I I I wrote getting it like an old fashioned love story because um, uh, because that's what I love. I love romantic comedies, and um, I mean I love all kinds of movies, but romantic comedies. That's just, just what does it for me is, is, is something that's just completely um, heartfelt uh, and, and I'm going to go on, on, out on a limb here and say, you know, what makes it interesting is any movie interesting is if the actors playing these roles um, are, are, have, have some chops. And I got very, very lucky, so lucky. Um, with with getting it, uh, the right people showed up. I have tremendous actors who who create characters that are believable and that people are interested in and that they care about what happens to. So um, to me, that is the ultimate reason for seeing a film is that it's going to involve me and make me care about it and and root for for the characters. You know, if um, if they need rooting for. And um, the characters in getting it certainly, you know, do need some rooting for them. Um, I uh, not much got left out. I don't really think. Um, I think I got everything in. Um, I everything that I wanted. Um, there were some special moments that I I was really worried I wouldn't get, and we actually didn't get one of the main ones until the very last day of, of pickups, like you know, a few months after the principal shoot. Um, the DVD uh, does have some extra um, some things on it. Uh, it has uh, it has my director notes, and it also has Donato De Luca's um, uh, his notes, his um, um, experience on the film. And then I also talk uh, separately about um, the songs in the movie that that I wrote and uh, the challenges with them, and how lucky I got with my composer who actually found me and wanted to score a film. And I was like, absolutely. I heard his music, which was incredibly beautiful. And um, towards the end, I still hadn't found an arranger for the songs that, uh, that I had written the uh, music and lyrics for. And at the, la- at the 11th hour, I said, <clears throat> would you, um, hey, Nicholas, would you consider uh, uh, arranging my three songs? And he'd never done it before. Um, and he, he knocked him out. Um, so uh, I tell, I'll talk a little bit about that and how grateful I am to him. Uh, Nicholas Jones, he's a, a tremendous artist and, uh, and 
his nuanced music throughout the film uh, really uh, makes these, you know, these moments even more special. And um, I'm, you know, I'm really excited uh, about his contribution and, and again uh, about my, my fellow actors who just, who brought it totally and knocked it out of the ballpark. And I'm just, I can't believe I got that lucky. I dig it, man. And uh, mm -hmm. let us know uh, where we can find you on social media and remind us on the platforms that we can stream the movie if we, we can't wait for the DVD. Yeah, it's on, on like, it's on every platform. You know, it's gonna be on, um, it's on Amazon, of course, iTunes, Google Play. Uh, it's on Vudu. Um, it's on uh, Deco. Um, it's, uh, and, and of course it is on the, the DVD is available. Um, if you go to breaking glass pictures website, you know, it's, it's on there. Um, and, uh, you know, with any luck, you know, um, if, uh, if the interest and excitement for the movie grows, you know, maybe it'll eventually be on subscription, um, video as well, like, uh, or, or streaming, uh, platforms like, uh, Netflix or Hulu, you know, that's, uh, that's another, uh, another goal. Sounds good. And if we want to connect with you on social media, where can we find Tom Hurd? Um, I am at actor, uh, at actor on Twitter, and that's actor with a K, because C was taken. <laughs> but I uh, and I was disappointed at first, and then I went, no, I kind of like this. Um, and on Instagram, I am um, at Atomic Tom, and again, it, that would have been at Atomic, but that was taken. Dang it. Um, and uh, let's see, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, but the, I'm out there and I would love to, you know, hear from people and uh, interact and, and uh, you know, talk about the movie. Perfect. Tom Hurd, writer, director, star, uh, you know, baker for, uh, for the craft service portion of, exactly, of, of yes. the set. You know, that's <laughs> it. Everything else that went along with getting it and making getting it. It's been a pleasure chatting with you and I can't wait to talk to you about the next film. Thanks so much, RC. I look forward to it too. Absolutely.